So I'm here with Richard Isseline, a professor at the University of Southern California and, well, the father of happiness ec economics. Um, uh, I think you started to work on this topic in, in, in the early 70s. What did you drive to, well, to, to get into it? Well, I was fortunate enough to be at the uh, Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford. And uh, at the center, uh, they bring together social scientists from uh, all different disciplines. And uh, in the course of, uh, I guess, a luncheon one day, uh, somebody mentioned there existed these data on happiness. <laughs> and I thought, well, it would be really interesting to see how happiness uh, related to income and whether economic growth uh, uh, raise people's happiness. And that's how I got started on it. So it was just a coincidence at a, at a lunch meeting? Yes, it, it, was, it was just this fortuitous discovery. And uh, so what I tried to do uh, at, the, at that time, we didn't have the general social uh, survey for the U.S. So what we had were a number of sort of uh, uh, scattered surveys, and I tried to uh, assemble them, uh, try to establish which ones were comparable to see what sort of picture I could get about uh, happiness uh, in the United States and also uh, in other countries. So in those days did you expect it would become as big as it, as it became afterwards? Well I thought it was sort of big, <laughs> but uh, the, the economics profession uh, 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 at that time, and even to some extent today, was uh, constrained by this disciplinary paradigm uh, that we don't pay any attention to what people say. We only uh, observe what they do. Uh, and so uh, uh, economists tend to resist any uh, statements that people make about why they do things or how well they feel about themselves. Uh, so, uh, understandably, uh, uh, they didn't, uh, at the time, pay much attention uh, to what was going on, to what I was saying. Do, do you think that right now the, the, the discipline is accepted by mainstream economists? I, my, my, my impression is that a lot of them still don't like, well, happiness economics and try to contradict your findings. Yes, I, th I think uh, that's exactly the case. Uh, I think uh, if you take uh, the recent Stevenson and Wolfer's paper that was uh, the claim uh, that uh, the happiness income paradox was wrong, uh, there's a, a group of quite prominent economists uh, who were involved in discussions. Uh, some of them are very cautious, like Gary Becker. He did not jump on their bandwagon. But others were delighted to see uh, the, the result claiming that the paradox was wrong. So you, since you already mentioned this paper, do, do you think the finding that, well, there isn't any Isseline paradox, at, if you look at the data correctly, as they claim, holds the water? Or? Uh, their finding really is based uh, upon uh, a confusion of the short-term relationship uh, between happiness and income. Uh, and the long-term relationship. Uh, so uh, think of, of an upward trend in GDP that's of a sawtooth nature, going up and down, sort of a, like a business cycle. Uh, happiness tends to display that same sawtooth pattern, but it's around a flat line, not a rising line like GDP. Uh, what they do is they take observations that capture the ups and downs. They don't take the long-term trends. What they observe is the positive relation that does exist between happiness and income over the business cycle. They do not observe the long-term relationship, which is nil. So what, from your point of view, is, is, is the most important insight of, of happiness economics? Well, of course, I'm prejudiced. <laughs> But I think uh, it, it suggests that uh, uh, leaving uh, the fruits of economic growth to be determined uh, by private decisions uh, does not raise people's well-being. Uh, 
and I think uh, in the talk I gave today, I, I tried to indicate that uh, uh, through public policies, uh, we could improve people's uh, well-being, uh, that uh, independently of economic growth, but of course, to the extent we have economic growth, that makes it easier to conduct these policies. So this is not an anti-growth view, it's that what we do with the fruits of economic growth uh, is going to have a different effect on happiness if we leave it entirely to the market and individual decisions versus if we use public policy to improve people's happiness. Can you give me some examples of, of, of the specific kinds of, of public policy you have in mind? Well, of course, the welfare states have instituted a wide range of policies. Uh, for example, child care policies and elderly care policies deal with concerns that are fundamental to people's happiness. Uh, let me give you a, a, another simple illustration. As a general matter, we know that uh, older women are less happy than older men, and that's because older women are much more likely not to have a partner. They're going to be widowed or divorced, whereas the men that survive to older age uh, are likely to be in unions because uh, the women are likely, their spouses are likely to be alive. Uh, now, health care policies uh, that improved uh, the longevity of uh, people, and, and especially of males, uh, would make it uh, possible uh, for women to live into later life uh, with a greater likelihood of having a spouse, uh, and uh, that would raise their happiness. So, in, in general, would you would you agree that one of the well most important lessons of, of happiness economics is that public policy and the state should play a bigger role than pro market economists suggest? Yes, I think that's what the evidence shows. Uh, I try to uh, to base my uh, uh, my conclusions uh, on what uh, the data show. Uh, it does not necessarily. Uh, require public policy, however, uh, to raise happiness. Uh, that is, the, the study uh, of the economics of happiness suggests that people have it within their own power uh, through uh, their decisions to raise their happiness, that uh, if they uh, simply pursue money, uh, that's likely to be self-defeating because aspirations tend to rise commensurately. But in other domains of life, uh, spending more time with your family, uh, exercising to improve your health, dieting, and so on, uh, you can improve your happiness. Uh, and therefore, uh, without any uh, governmental intervention, uh, it's people to, uh, it, who, if they are better informed, uh, will make, can make decisions that will raise their happiness. All I'm talking about is essentially analogous to uh, policies in which we try to educate people with regard to uh, their physical health, such as smoking. Uh, so we, we, we have educated people and, and that's had a significant impact on reducing smoking and, and improving uh, their health. And I'm talking now about policies that would have a, a similar impact on their mental health. Do you think politicians in general and in, in the U.S. specifically take those findings seriously enough? Uh, I, I think there's a vast difference between Europe and the United States. Europe is uh, very much in the forefront of uh, drawing upon uh, work and the economics of happiness, starting to implement official collection of happiness data uh, in, uh, and utilize those data in the formation of public policies. Uh, so, uh, I think uh, the developments in Europe are very encouraging. I see no counterpart of that in uh, the United States. And I think, in, in, indeed, uh, that uh, the discipline of economics uh, in Europe and in the United States uh, also reflects that. I think the acceptance of happiness research is much greater in Europe. Uh, among European economists and social scientists than it is in the United States. So both 
on the disciplinary side and the public policy side, uh, I think uh, the United States is a severe laggard, uh, much to my regret. <laughs> what do you suspect is the, as the reason for this continental divide? Uh, I, th I think the uh, American uh, discipline and uh, American politicians are much more uh, uh, free market oriented in their general outlook uh, and much uh, more questioning of the value of governmental intervention. Uh, whereas in Europe they are more open minded about uh, uh, the utilization of government to improve public uh, human well being. There is this idea, or there, there was this idea, of having a gross happiness index similar to the to the gross national product. Do you think that we, we should try to build something like a national happiness index? Yes, I really don't know what 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 people have in mind who propose this, and I don't know what uh, an index would comprise. Uh, my feeling is that the uh, the, the measurement of well-being, uh, whether we talk about GDP or happiness involves matters of scope, what you include, and valuation, how you put the things together. Uh, and in regard to GDP, there's a basic underlying economic theory that justifies the use of uh, prices. Uh, there's no economic theory justifying the scope uh, that's involved uh, in, in GDP. In the case of happiness, the beauty of it is that each individual uh, essentially, uh, the scope of what he what determines his happiness and how he puts them together is done by each individual, uh, and and so you don't have to have an outside scholar or scientist to try to determine that. You're left with the question, of course, whether you can aggregate across individuals, and there the justification is well when you explore with people uh, what they think are is important. Uh, for happiness, you find uh, throughout the world uh, the same factors being mentioned, which are making a living, uh, family considerations, health considerations, the kind of job uh, that you're able to get. Uh, so the, uh, the aggregation is justified on the grounds that what's important uh, in determining happiness is by and large quite uniform across individuals. That doesn't mean it's the same for you and me, but when we're talking about countries as a whole and how countries change over time, uh, I feel that uh, the aggregation of individuals is quite justified. So I, I take the existing measures of happiness or life satisfaction as unitary measures comparable to GDP that aggregate across the relevant uh, factors that they uh, put them together uh, and that they can be combined among individuals uh, in a meaningful way to get measures of people's well-being. Okay, one final question. What do you think are the open, the, the most important open questions when it comes to happiness economics? I, I, I think uh, establishing uh, clearly the impact of, of different uh, public policies is important and also uh, 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 shifting individual decisions, although I think we know more about that. Uh, so I, I view uh, the research as moving increasingly into a, a policy agenda uh, in the future. All right, thank you very much. Okay.